Hello everybody, welcome to Wine World TV, the best wine show anywhere. I'm your host, Mark Fusco. Before we get started, make sure you're smashing that like button and subscribing to the channel. Every like and subscription really helps build the channel. You know what else is helpful? Tell all your friends about it. Tell them about the best wine show anywhere. All right, so welcome to Freestyle Friday where I get to do what I want. Time for more of the how the sausage or wine is made videos. No BS, just straight talk about how wine is made. I'm going to strip away the romance and pull back the curtain, if you will. Be that anonymous magician that shows you how the magic trick is done or made. Not to put down how wine is made or shame anyone. This is just the reality of it. All right, we're almost halfway through my series of episodes of farming practices and the wines that come from them. As I mentioned in my farming overview episode, these shows are in response to the healthier, cleaner, or natural wine ads I've been seeing for months. Today's show is going to go a bit more in depth on biodynamic farming. So what is biodynamic farming, or sometimes just called bio? Well, biodynamics has been described to me by one winemaker who practices, practices it as organic farming on steroids. That's a gross oversimplification and probably a bit inaccurate. Bio is a combination of organic farming and mysticism wrapped into some voodoo. Do the wines taste good? Not as good as any other wines. Do they taste better than conventionally farmed or made wines or organic wines? Well, some claim to be able to tell the difference. I'm sure a quick search of the inner tubes will provide plenty of articles saying organic and bio wines taste better than industrially made wines. It's a very subjective thing but in many ways, organic and biodynamic wines will show more character, if you will. My meaning is that these are usually wines of lower production, wines where the winemakers uh, are able to pay more attention to the entire process. Unlike a wine that had a production into the tens or hundreds of thousands of cases, but you can make that argument for just about any product that is small production. Even wines that were more conventionally made. In a nutshell, it is based on organic farming. However, there are really no, uh, there really are no synthetics used at any point in the process. So everything we learned about organics the past couple of videos applies here. We take away any chance of using a synthetic though. Any kind of normal organic pesticide or fertilizer is replaced with the biodynamic version. Other aspects like cover crops, water management, soil management, etc., are going to be the same or have a biodynamic equivalent. We'll eventually cover those things that biodynamics uh, does differently than organic. The one thing that most people have probably heard of are the nine preparations or treatments that have some unusual ingredients and quite frankly, bizarre ways they are prepared. Then there is the mysticism of certain types of days you should do things in the vineyard, the winery, or even drink wine. And finally, well, belief in astrology. So yeah. Organic farming and mysticism wrapped inside some voodoo. One of the problems with bi biodynamic winemaking is there is no legal status for it. But we're starting to get ahead of things, so let's get some backstory first so we can put all of this into context in regards to this series of videos I've been doing. Now, have you watched them yet? Well, you probably should. While not critical to understanding this in future videos, at least knowing about organic farming and those wines will help with this subject. All right, like modern organic farming, biodynamic farming started in the 1920s. In 1924, an Austrian occultist philosopher named Rudolf Steiner pre uh, presented a series of eight lectures on agriculture in what was Germany at the time, but is now Poland. According to Wikipedia, these lectures were the first known presentation of organic agriculture. Now that doesn't mean it predates organic. We learned that a few years earlier in 1921, the husband and wife team of Albert and Gabrielle Howard first started organic farming in India. In the bigger picture, it doesn't matter who was first. However, if you're someone like me taking a wine certification exam of any kind, 
You're probably not going to be asked about the origin of organic farming, but you'll very likely encounter the who created biodynamic farming in what year. Anyway, these series of lectures was done at the request of farmers who were concerned about the declining soil conditions from using the somewhat newfangled chemical fertilizers and pesticides. His lectures were a proposal of sorts for creating research into what he called arthrop arthroposophic agriculture. That's a little bit of a tongue twister. Steiner did a bit of everything. At his core, he was a philosopher who based a lot of his stuff on Johann Goethe, I'm not going to go too deep into all this. I've included the Wikipedia links to Steiner and Goethe for you to check out if you want. Just remember that Goethe was known primarily as a writer of various kinds of works in addition to being a scientist in the 18th and 19th centuries. As far as Steiner, uh, Wikipedia describes him as an Austrian philosopher, social reformer, architect, esotericist, and claimed clairvoyant. Nowhere do you see farmer. As a matter of fact, the word farmer is only found once in his Wikipedia entry in reference to the farmers he was invited to talk to about his idea of anthroposophic agriculture. Eh, I got it right this time, I think. I, I'm not saying he didn't dabble in agriculture. I'm just saying that he didn't earn a living in it or have any real background in it. The basic idea of biodynamic is a combination of science and spirituality, which was part of the beginnings of his work. When he created arthroposophic uh, agriculture, he was trying to apply his philosophy to more practical endeavors like agriculture, medicine, and education. So alternative farming, alternative medicine, and holistic education. All three are still done today. The education is known as Waldorf education. I'll let you dive down that rabbit hole. The links for all of that are in uh, this Wikipedia or his Wikipedia entry. Let's get back to biodynamic farming. I'm just going to quote directly from Wikipedia because, well, it's worded pretty well. Quote, Biodynamics has much in common with other organic approaches. It emphasizes the use of manures and composts and excludes the use of synthetic or artificial fertilizers, pesticides, and herbicides on soil and plants. Methods unique to the biodynamic approach include its treatment of animals, crops, and soil as a single system. An emphasis from its beginnings on local production and distribution systems, its use of traditional and development of new local breeds and varieties. Some methods use an astrological sowing and planting calendar. Biodynamic agriculture uses various herbal and mineral additives for compost additives and field sprays. These are prepared using methods that are more akin to sympathetic magic than agronomy, such as burying ground quartz stuffed into the horn of a cow, which are said to have which are said to harvest cosmic forces in the soil. Continuing, no difference in beneficial outcomes has been scientifically established between certified biodynamic agriculture techniques and similar organic and integrated farming practices. Biodynamic agriculture lacks the strong scientific evidence for its efficacy and has been labeled a pseudoscience because of its reliance on esoteric knowledge and mystical beliefs. All right, so a big part of biodynamic farming is the farm being an entire ecosystem rather than a monocrop farm. This includes crop rotation, cover crops, livestock, and other beneficial animals. The farm is considered an organism, a quote, self-containing entity with its own individuality. When it comes to vineyards, the use of cover crops qualifies it as using crop rotation and not being a monocrop. This is also true when talking about organic farming and crop rotation. The goal for a vineyard is to have grapes and other crops, such as olive trees or maybe another tree fruit. They certainly can grow other crops too. Add to that some kind of livestock to provide manure or to graze the vineyards during certain times of the year to help with weed management. You can then add an insectary for pest and disease management. Other ways to introduce diversity may include, but is not limited to, forests, wetlands, and riparian corridors. While I haven't visited a lot of certified bio vineyards, Benziger in Sonoma follows these basic elements to show off what a biodynamic vineyard can be like. You should check it out. Fertilizers and pesticides are handled utilizing what you can do on the property rather than buying a commercial product. That's not to say a vineyard can't buy a biodynamic product to use on the farm. Just that the preferred method is to make everything yourself. 
The reason for this is that the goal is to keep things within the natural ecosystem. Remember, the farm or vineyard is considered as a whole, parts of an organism with a natural energy. This starts with manures. Animal waste is what most of us think about. With the animals living on the property, they are giving back what they took away. Another kind of manure is, quote, green manure. This is plant waste. Essentially, you take the uprooted or sown crop parts and leave them to decompose in the field. Not something that normally happens in a vineyard, but it can be done with any cover crops or crops elsewhere on the property. Another part of biodynamics are what are known as preparations or teas. Steiner proposed nine treatments in 1924. They remain the same today. They are divided into two types. You have field preparations and compost preparations. Here is a list of them taken directly from Wikipedia. First, field preparations. All right, so field preparations for stimulating hummus formation. You have 500, a hummus mixture prepared by filling a cow's horn with cow manure and burying it in the ground, about 40 to 60 centimeters below the surface in the autumn. It is left to decompose during the winter and recovered for use as fertilizer the following spring. Then you have 501. This is that quartz stuff, the crushed powder quartz stuffed into a cow's horn and buried in the ground in the springtime and taken out in the autumn. It can be mixed with 500, but is usually prepared on its own. The mixture is sprayed under very low pressure over the crop during the wet season as a supposed antifungal. Next, we have compost preparations. The compost preparations Steiner recommended employ herbs with, which are frequently used in alternative medicine remedies. Many of the same herbs Steiner referenced are used in organic practices to make foliar fertilizers, green manure, or in composting. The preparations Steiner discussed were 502. These are yarrow blossoms stuffed into the urinary bladders from red deer, placed in the sun during the summer, buried in the ground during winter, and retrieved in the spring. Then we have 503. That would be chamomile blossoms stuffed into the small intestines of cattle, buried in hummus-rich earth in the autumn and retrieved in the spring. Then we have 504. These are stinging nettle plants in full bloom, stuffed together underground, surrounded on all sides by peat for a year. Next, 505. Oak bark chopped in small pieces, placed inside the skull of a domesticated animal, surrounded by peat and buried in the ground in a place near rain runoff. All right, then 506. That would be dandelion flowers stuffed into the mesentery of a cow. Now, a mesentery is your, um, it, it's considered an organ that kind of keeps your guts in place, to be honest. It, it, it helps keep the intestines uh, secure. Uh, anyway, uh, so this is buried in the ground during winter and retrieved in the spring. 507, that would be valerian flowers extracted into water. And then 508 just says horsetail. Okay. Now, if you watch my organic series, then hummus might be familiar. We're talking about hummus with one M, not two. In case you don't remember or just don't know, hummus denominates the fraction of soil organic material that is amorphous and without the, quote, cellular cake structure characteristic of plants, microorganisms, or animals. In agriculture, hummus sometimes also is used to describe mature or natural compost extracted from a woodland or other spontaneous source for use as a soil conditioner. It is also used to describe a topsoil horizon that contains organic matter. Another word that was weird to me was mesentery, which I just explained, but I'm going to explain one more time because I actually scripted it out. Basically, it's an internal organ that provides support and structure to the intestines. At least that's what I surmised. The one thing that most people know about these preparations is the cow horn and that Something is put inside it and then buried. What many people don't know is that this cow horn is dug up eventually and then a spray is created from the contents, which I kind of already described. Normally it's not just one cow horn, but quite a few. Different things are put in the cow horns via preparations 500 and 501, but that's not the only animal part as you just heard. As to the, as to the significance of using animal parts with these other ingredients, it has to do with how that ingredient can help with some kind of homeopathic treatment, and that's why you use that body part. It's animal-specific too. 
During my research of all this, I reached out to the Demeter USA organization. Originally, it was to ask about the calendar effects, uh, how, how the calendar affects operations in the winery. They put me in contact with Rudy Marchese at Montanor Estate out in uh, Willamette Valley in Oregon. He's the owner of the property since 2005, having worked there for several years prior. A quick side note here, even though I visited Willamette a couple years ago, I wasn't sure exactly how this winery's name was pronounced. It looks Italian, so I naturally pronounce it like an Italian, Montenore. During our exchanges, I asked Rudy how it was pronounced, and he let me know that it was an Italian in origin. It's a made-up name. The original owners combined Montana in Oregon. Mont in or. Very creative. I'm not sure how Montana fits in the story, but my guess is the original owners had some, or the property had some kind of connection to Montana. Anyway, uh, I've had a couple wines from Montenor and they are excellent. So if you see them around, you should try them seriously. Anyway, we exchanged emails and during that exchange, I asked about the significance of the preparations in relation to the ingredients. He graciously gave me permission to directly quote his email concerning this. All right, so uh, let's start off with, he says, you asked some interesting questions. Let's start with the preparations. The Preps are all, quote, cured in a sheath of some kind derived from animal parts, mostly cow. Why this is done is complicated. What I can say is that each substance, be it chamomile, dandelion, oak bark, etc., has its own dynamic chemistry. The sheath it is cured in has a polar opposite energy, creating a dynamic relationship between the substance and its sheath. This results in a richer, more enlivened substance after the curing period than, would be, than what would occur without this polar exchange of energy. I know the ingredients for the prep sound kind of, quote, out there to today's population of whom less than 5% are farmers, but 100 years ago, when Rudolf Steiner introduced this farming method, uh, farming was a very common occupation. Then, most farmers had diverse operations, raised and slaughtered their own animals, and utilized almost all of the animal for food and clothing. So for farmers 100 years ago, it was not odd at all to stuff dandelions into cow stomach lining or to stuff chamomile into cow's intestines like sausage. As a modern farmer, after one uses these techniques for a while, the logic and creative intelligence that created them become apparent, though not always easy to describe and define. Okay, so I can say that this is the best explanation I've ever seen regarding this. Other explanations I have read implied a lot of this, but really left a lot of things blank. And while I'm still skeptical as to how these preparations are inherently better than normal organic methods, at least it makes more sense. So the following is going to help explain why each of these does a certain thing. Some are sprays, some are directly added to the compost. I took these directly from the Biodynamic Trainees website. First are the field preparations. Now both of these are sprays. So 500, that's the hummus and cow horn, then enhances the life of the soil and the relationship between soil and plants. Then 501, that's the quartz and the cow horn, that increases plant immunity, strengthens photosynthesis, and enhances ripening. Next, we have the compost preparations. So all of these are added to compost, except actually the very last one is a spray, and then 507 is a sprayed, is sprayed over compost, where the others are just actually added to compost. All right, so 502, that's yarrow and deer bladder. That helps the soil draw in substances. 503 is the chamomile and cattle intestine. That helps to stabilize plant nutrients and invigorate plant growth. 504 is the stinging nettles and peat. That develops sensitivity in the soil and helps to stabilize nitrogen. 505, that's oak bark in a skull with peat. Helps increase a plant's resistance to disease. 506, that is the dandelion and cow stomach lining. So this one is, is worded really weird. It says, activities, light influences in the soul. Not sure what that means. All right, 507, this is uh, the one that's sprayed over compost. Uh, that's the valerian flowers, and it's just listed as, it's listed as protection. And then 508, listed as this horsetail, that one is just a spray. That prevents fungal diseases and balances the water elements. All right. So I was upfront with Rudy about having a healthy skepticism about, about biodynamics. Not all of it, but the preparations are one of the things I'm skeptical about. I'm sure there are some actual benefits to many of these, but some of these are just kind of weird. 
Uh, the whole thing here is that these are ways to improve your compost or help soil or plant health. And, and like Rudy said, I guess if you use these, you, you, see, you see the benefits from it. Now, the big connection here and throughout biodynamics is energy. That there's an overriding belief that there is a connection between the land, plants, animals, sun, moon, stars, etc. We'll get to that last bit next. All right, next we have the calendar. It's mostly based on a lunar calendar and astrology. This calendar determines much of what you do on the farm or in the vineyard. This includes planting, pruning, applying a treatment, doing canopy management, harvest, etc. This can also dictate some functions in the winery and even if it's a good day to taste wine. So it was difficult to really get any concrete information as to how the calendar influences what's done in the winery compared to the vineyard. Just about every search talked about the vineyard. I found a couple conflicting calendars from different wineries when it came to uh, vineyard operations. Nothing, or well, actually winery operations too. Nothing major, but each had a couple differences. Rudy also gave me his impression when it comes to how the calendar applies to the winery itself and, and the vineyard. So I'll quote him again. I quote, As for the calendar, I think too much emphasis is placed upon its impact on operations. I do believe that there are ebbs and flows in energy in our environment, and it makes absolute sense to take advantage of them when possible. We do, however, have to get our work done and we have to consider the lives and schedules of our farm workers so we can't be living reactively to subtle changes in the influence of the moon and the solar system. That being said, I have personally seen that there are times when it is very unfavorable to plant and harvest, so those times should be avoided. I view the calendar as a general guideline mostly for gardening and farming activity. In the winery, we avoid blackout days for harvest, and bottling and choose the most favorable days for harvesting our best blocks. Again, a good explanation. W better than pretty much any other one I'd seen. But one thing I want to point out here, while biodynamics, organics, and other methods are trying to achieve a goal when it comes to farming or winemaking, it's still a business. A business that has to also take care of the people that work for it too. There is a balance with what makes sense for the business, the people, and the wine or the vineyard. Whenever I've talked with a winemaker that is either certified bio or practices bio, they've all been reasonable about it. While they may be doing the preparations or follow the calendar, they've also had a similar attitude to Rudy that they aren't dogmatic to the calendar. I'm sure there are some though. So with all that said, how does the calendar influence farming? Well, there are four types of days. They're called root, leaf, flower, and fruit. Each corresponds to the four elements, earth, water, air, and fire. I had a hard time finding more than a basic list of what to do in the vineyard and when it was ideal to actually drink wine. And Rudy and I already mentioned that there are some things in the winery that are better to do on certain days and things to avoid. For now, here is the pretty universal list of what to do in a vineyard and when to drink wine. Right, so on a root day associated with earth, ideal days, uh, these are ideal days for pruning, considered the worst day to drink wine. But at least one person told me it does bring out the earthiness in wine, at least for that person. Whether that's a good or bad thing may depend on the person who's tasting. A leaf day associated with water. These are ideal days for water plants considered a somewhat neutral day to drink wine, though it may be good for wines at least four to five years old. Uh, the jury's still out on that. Flower, associated with air. Uh, it says, leave the vineyard alone, but is considered a good day to drink wine. And then fruit, associated with fire. Best days for harvest and best day to drink wine. Don't know what happens with the fifth element, though. And uh, this is... Lilu Dallas Multipass. Yeah. Concerning the best or worst day to drink wine, from what I've been able to glean, there are better days to drink wine than others. Some people will prefer to drink a wine on a flower day instead of a fruit day. Root days apparently enhance the earthiness of the wine, like I already mentioned. I mean, for me, I kind of like earthiness of many wines versus fruitiness, so that might be a good day for me. There is an app called Wine When 
that will let you know what kind of day it is and whether it's a good day or a bad day to drink wine. However, remember that day type is for all aspects of biodynamics. What I found out from reading the info part of this app is that wine industry people feel there is also a correlation to the type of day and how well a wine will, quote, show or taste. Supposedly, there are two large supermarket chains in the UK that only schedule wine tasting for critics when the wines will be at their best, at, at their best based on the day type, fruit or flower. I'll pretty much quote directly from the app as to how all this works. It's been the most comprehensive explanation I've found out there without having to read a ton of materials. I did have someone say, I should read all the Steiner stuff, and I, my, my reply was, I really don't have time for that. I mean, in hindsight, I probably could have because it's, it was a long time since I wrote the script versus recording this. But at the time, I'm like, I had so much other stuff that trying to read all that, I can just you know get this type of stuff here. All right, so from the app, there are 12 star constellations in our skies through which the moon, the sun, and all the planets pass. We know them as the Zodiac, Scorpio, Cancer, Aries, etc. But in the context of this guide, these names are used to indicate the physical star constellations rather than the astrological signs used in horoscopes. The 12 constellations are grouped in four different types, which correspond to the four types of, quote, days in this guide. Virgo, Capricorn, Taurus are associated with root days. Libra, Aquarius, and Gemini are flower. Scorpio, Pisces, Cancer, that's for leaf. And Sagittarius, Aries, and Leo are for fruit. Every month, the moon moves through each constellation in turn. In fact, it takes about 27.5 days for the moon to complete one cycle. As the moon moves into a particular constellation, that type of, quote, day takes over. For example, if the moon moves into Libra at 11 a.m., from 11 a.m. onwards is normally considered to be a, quote, flower day. Sometimes you also get periods which are, quote, generally unfavorable for any aspect of biodynamic planting or harvesting or drinking wine. This is normally due to other planetary influences coming in play or an eclipse. The influence of other heavenly bodies can also affect the exact start and end time of a type of day. So there's not always an exact correlation with lunar constellations. So that's the explanation to how a day becomes one of the four types. So depending on your local time zone, 11 a.m. may be when a day switches into a different day. What do I think about this? about the days to taste wine. I'm very skeptical. I've known people in the industry who swear by it, but I'm not convinced. All right, so during the time I was writing this script, I decided to test this out. It wasn't a true scientific test, however. So a few different times when I struggled with some wine tasting, I decided to see what kind of day it was, usually well after the fact. Some of the time my tasting was good or excellent too. What I can say is that how well I personally tasted, whether it was a blind, a review, or just tasting, the type of day didn't seem to make a wine taste better or worse than expectation. I also looked to see if the date I took my tasting portion of the advanced exam in 2020, literally days before the national COVID lockdown, to see if it was a good day or bad day. According to the app, March 9th, 2020 was not a good day. It didn't specify if it was a root or leaf day, however. Is that why I didn't pass that portion of the exam? I don't believe so. I believe it's tied to my approach to deductive tasting or my lack of providing enough descriptors sometimes. That's exactly why I didn't pass. I didn't show enough of my work in the nose and the palate to justify my conclusions. Even if I had at least 60% of them correct, just like math class, you have to show your work. And if you watched my blind tasting of the six Napa I'm sorry, the six California cabs, I wrote this before that, you'll see that it's really difficult to memorize everything you say, especially if you're doing six wines at the same time. In our exams, you do one wine at a time and you have to memorize what you're saying and make it correlate to what your, your call is. We saw that in that tasting, I didn't write any of my stuff down. So I made wrong decisions based upon like really quick, like five second tastes afterwards. But my actual descriptions of each wine was absolutely accurate for the quality of the wine. So anyway, regarding all this other stuff, the former astronomy major, yes, I was an astronomy major, treats things like this with a skeptical eye. 
And this looks like a good time to split up this episode, actually. We'll continue with biodynamics next time, but we're going to look at the winemaking part of it. Now, I hope you got value from this episode. If you enjoy what I'm doing here, make sure to hit the like button and subscribe, and then tell your friends. And until next time, we'll get into biodynamic winemaking.